Well, we've had great days, uh, for me anyway, it's been such a joy. And so we've looked a bit at Thomas, and then uh, Peter, James, and John, and Matthew's Gospel, and now today we want to look at a passage in Luke. So I'll ask you to have this open, Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 43. On this, uh, my final morning with you, I want to consider this passage in Luke chapter 23 and some lessons to be learned from a dying man in his only encounter, at least in so much as we know in the Bible, his only encounter with Jesus. Actually, this account includes three dying men, but we're only going to concentrate on two of them, Jesus himself and the one repentant criminal. So let's read the passage and then we'll pray and invite the Spirit to teach us. Verse 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, where they crucified him, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves, The people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Do we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Lord God, let the Holy Spirit be our guide, our teacher, our counselor, lead us into truth. Help us see here things that you want to speak to our hearts individually and corporately. Give us hearts of surrender to obey, to follow you with joy. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I want to begin by saying something ever so briefly first about the power of forgiveness, as we see it so clearly in this story, particularly verse 34, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus is forgiving all, even as they crucify him. And first, it says something about the power of Jesus' forgiveness, even for you, for me. This may be why scholars think that perhaps the repentant criminal responded to Jesus as he did, because he witnessed Jesus' amazing power to forgive the very worst injustice of all, to forgive even in the process of being executed. Now this speaks loads to me that Jesus doesn't just say to the Father, forgive them, but he goes on to remind 
the Father and us as we read it, that they don't even know what they are doing. They have not come to Jesus and asked for his forgiveness. They are not acknowledging the gross injustice of crucifying the Lamb of God. Reminds us, for we can all approximate what Gregory Jones in a phenomenal study, a theological analysis of forgiveness entitled Embodying Forgiveness, he calls forgiveness equanimity. Forgiveness equanimity when wrong is acknowledged and admitted and there's kind of an equal play. It's much easier to forgive when somebody says, I did you wrong, and I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? But what about when there's no equanimity, like the model of Christ himself, when they don't even know what they're doing? Forgiveness is never easy, but it's certainly easier when someone comes to you and says, I'm so sorry, I was wrong, I offended you, I sinned against you. But most of the time that does not happen. Most of the time it's like this, where God will ask you to forgive when it is not any equanimity about it. That's what we see in the power of Jesus' forgiveness. So that, secondly, it says something about the power of your forgiveness towards others, doesn't it? In my years serving in different ways, I've really come to see that spiritual growth, one of the greatest hindrances to spiritual growth, is an unforgiving spirit or requiring forgiveness equanimity. Oh, I can forgive if you ask me, if you acknowledge you're wrong. But what about that spirit of forgiveness when the person won't acknowledge or doesn't even know? Jesus leaves us an example that you and I can model the power of forgiveness. St. Peter in his letter encourages us that all that Jesus did is in part a model to us. So this is too. Even to forgive those who hurt you most. This summer, some of the people sitting next to you, you will need to forgive. There will be parents that you need to forgive. As you grow up and discover your parents can be wrong. What a shock that was to me. <laughs> My father, the great missionary doctor, really in all so many ways, modeled Jesus, but he could be wrong. He could sin, and I could forgive him, as he forgave me so many times. So I want to ask again that we do this exercise. I think silence is so much a part of worship. To take a moment of silence and reflect is there anybody right now God is asking you to forgive without requiring Gregory Jones' idea of forgiveness equanimity? They may not even know or they may not be willing to acknowledge wrong towards you or sin. Reflect on that and ask the Spirit to give you the power to forgive right now.
Just before we go on in the text, I have to remind you that some of the strongest words of Jesus Christ are around this topic of forgiveness. These are verses I'd rather kind of skip over, but Jesus said them. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Cuts me to the quick. I don't know how to explain that, but that's what Jesus said. Now let's skip down to verse 42 and 43. Put your finger in the text, like we say to our young Muslim converts. Verse 42 and 43. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. These, of course, are the words, the first verse of the one repentant criminal hanging near death. Get this image in your mind beside Jesus in the horrors of crucifixion himself. <coughs> And his very first words spoken directly to Jesus, perhaps in his own life, his whole life, is simply the first word, Jesus. Did you know that this is the only place in all of the Gospels where Jesus is spoken to using only his name? No title, master, no designation, rabbi, no role, Lord Jesus, simply Jesus. And Bible scholars have noted that this is certainly an expression of intimacy like a close personal friendship. You're free to call me Dr. White, but I so love it when you become my friend and we develop intimacy. And you just say, Wesley, Just don't ever call me reverend. <laughs> I'm far from reverend. I'm sort of a doctor. <laughs> but Wesley, Jesus, intimacy, and it comes from the most unlikely of people, a criminal about to die. And somehow he knows he can relate to Jesus perhaps because they're sharing a death experience. Jesus. Don't overlook that this is the only time Christ is spoken to in this way in all of the Gospels by a criminal dying beside him. This is the outside one. And it's reminding us that Luke so often portrays in his Gospel the Gospel for the outsider. The outsider may have more real intimacy with Christ than the well-versed professional Christian. It shows us the depths of Jesus' love that he relates in love and intimacy to anyone, even the worst of criminals who turns to him. Luke emphasizes this over and over here in this passage. Only Luke records this. Only Luke records the story of an outcast named Zacchaeus. Only Luke records the story of an outcast 
who's the only named character in any parable of Jesus, and his name is Lazarus, who lay at the door of a rich man. The rich man's not named, but Lazarus is the outcast, the poor, the one who just pleaded for some crumbs from the table. Jesus pays attention to the outsider. But it also shows us the possibility that any one of us can have intimacy with Jesus no matter what we have done. If we cry out Jesus, we turn to him. It won't surprise me at all if there's a good number of you here right now and over the next weeks, the others joining us, who really need intimacy. Oh, you know the right things to say. Perhaps can quote Bible verses. You can put on a good professional Christian image. But deep down you long for intimacy that just says, Jesus, join the outsiders that Jesus actually prioritizes with the gospel. And seek that intimacy. Find it this summer. Cast away your professional Christian demeanor and be desperate. For Christ. This same verse 42 also says something to us about actually applying the work of the cross to our lives. This is at the heart of it when this repentant criminal says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me. Did you ever stop to think, what does that mean? Remember. Does he think Jesus will forget? No, it is the Greek phrase menesthe tu mu and is used throughout the Old Testament in Hebrew, tzikare ne, it's a translation of that into Greek menesthe te mu, remember me, to cry out to God historically in Hebrew, Jewish, Israeli tradition to say, Remember me for blessing. It's a call for blessing. These words, says Joel Green, one of the premier New Testament scholars, in fact, a Luke specialist, reminds us, these words echo words repeatedly addressed to Yahweh, whose memory is a source of divine blessing in keeping with his covenant. And here it is in reference to the ultimate blessing of all, that the impact of, the effect of the cross of Christ be applied to a sincerely repentant man. This is what this unnamed outcast is seeking when he calls out, Jesus, remember me. Because it is not as though Jesus would forget. It does not mean remember me in that sense. It is a Hebraic tradition of asking for the blessing of God. But it is the full of this belief of this man, and he is so right, that the very work of the cross that he is witnessing, perhaps visually closer in fact, not perhaps, absolutely the closest visual witness to the death of Jesus. He realizes it must be personally applied. Remember me. This is a statement calling for the application of the work of the cross personally. And again, young women, young men, all of us, staff and faculty, what about you? What about me? I urge that we need to move from history 
to doctrine, to personal application. History is important. The veracity of the Bible depends on its her historical validity. Doctrine, what we teach based on this is absolutely important, but we are required in biblical faith to move from history to doctrine to personal application. Lord, bring the blessing to me, this man is saying, of what you are doing on this cross now, apply it to me. And so I ask you, I don't assume that everyone has actually personally applied the cross, the atoning work of Jesus recorded here to your life. And so I invite you to do that. When you come to this table in a few moments, you can do it right then. Take in the bread and say, thank you, Jesus, for your body for me. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood for me. I want you to remember me. Bless me with the ultimate blessing of the work of the cross in my life. And is it not incredible in verse 42 as well that this man is obviously aware somehow, somewhere in his background, maybe he was an ardent student of the Talmud or the Masoretic text or the stories of a Messiah, but he's aware in this statement of the kingdom purposes of Jesus. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Somehow along the way, he of all people, a criminal, came to understand this, the very essence of Christianity. This is not about your kingdom, as in you as king of your world, your agenda, your domain. It is about your kingdom, as in Jesus' agenda. The message of Jesus hammered through over and over and over again in all four Gospels, the kingdom of God. In which Jesus is king of all and Lord of all. And his agenda is paramount because he is the king. Kingdom theology is at the heart of Christ's message and ministry. And it includes kingdom power. It includes kingdom justice. It includes kingdom character. It includes kingdom morality. It includes the very upside down nature of this kingdom in which the widows are lifted up. The children are exalted. The least is given priority. It's an upside down kingdom in which the great and the rich and the powerful take the last seats. I'm so glad for the queen of Chehi. Because she is a queen, because she models the upside down kingdom to me, I invite you to follow Janet Raleigh. And with your high musical and academic acumen, 
bring it to the least, to the inner city, to the problem schools, to the hardest areas of the world, to the places of deprivation that Jesus would say, that is my priority. You cannot get away from that in all the narratives of the Bible. God lifts up the lowly and pushes down the proud and arrogant, the wealthy, the rich. I so appreciate the Queen who does that well. And I urge you to think of a career of bringing your musical gifts, your mental gifts to the least around you. Do you know that in Scotland, in Glasgow, where we live, the Royal Scottish Conservatoire, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, requires one of the premier training schools in Europe for the arts, all the arts, but mainly it's known for music, requires their students to socially apply their musical gifts. They are required for four years of enrollment there to take music to the deprived schools, to the local neighborhoods that get overlooked because of their drug problems. They are required, some of them go into the prisons to bring soul to those whose souls have been so deadened. They even go into the detention centers where people that I know and love are sent if they're going to be deported out of the country. And musicians from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland must learn to do this. The Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, not a Christian institution at all. But what a model. Could you get a vision for that? The kingdom purposes of Christ. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. All of those things are part of the kingdom, but it is all premised on this very important Christological truth. Simplified to this, Jesus is king, and you are not. Can you get that? Jesus Christ is king, and you are not. And then we come to Jesus' own one-sentence response. In all of this story, there's one sentence given to the mouth of Christ. Truly, I say to you, verse 43, today you shall be with me in paradise. Again, this text is a reminder of how God gives incredible preference, not to the scholarly and rich and privileged and powerful, but to the marginalized, the small, the outcast, the vulnerable, the sinful, the criminals, the poor. Because this man, this criminal, in being the recipient of the promise of paradise from Jesus, is the recipient of the future picture of what? Well, it all depends on what paradise means, doesn't it? Do you know what it means, literally? It comes from a Persian influence on an Aramaic word, paradiso. It means God's garden. And without question, it purposely sees the forever future of heaven as a return to a garden, Eden, a restored Eden, earthly, material, perfect, freed from sin. The answer to Jesus' prayer, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
a garden renewed into perfection, what N.T. Wright calls the forever future that is all about not destruction but new creation, heavenly truth revealed of such magnitude to this the least a criminal being executed. But if nothing else, this response from Jesus himself no doubt clarifies the reality of eternity. The term paradise is only found three mentions of it in the Bible. The other two are by the Apostle Paul. And that very paucity, a hermeneutic of paucity, meaning some things are drawn, drawing your attention by their infrequency, and this is one of them, in which Paul verifies so clearly in Revelation 2.7 that this garden picture is a restored Eden that is the future. It's about forever an eschatological Eden restoration paradise, and it is very simply defined here as being with Jesus. For all we might say about what it will be, I can guarantee you this, it's a restoration of Eden, and it will be characterized by being with Jesus. Today you shall be with me in paradise. That's what, why I do what I do. I believe that is coming, and I want many to join me in that. You know, if you're like me, you sometimes think, maybe you've discussed this, when this new creation, this restored Eden comes that we call heaven, who is it that you want to meet, talk with? Some of the great composers who had faith, J.S. Bach, some great <coughs> scholar who helped you understand, like St. Paul, loved ones who've gone on before. I often think about that, and you know who I want to meet? This unnamed criminal. I want to say, what did you see? Hanging there beside the Christ as he is crucified, what was it that allowed you intimacy, kingdom awareness, Anticipating paradise. As this text leads us, and as we've seen Jesus in all these stories this week, with Thomas, Peter, James, and John, and the Transfiguration Mountain, and this criminal, I think it is perhaps most fitting that we conclude this week with the Great Thanksgiving, the Eucharist, the table of communion. And that we come today like this repentant criminal. As you eat bread and drink this juice to remember that Jesus died for you. Personally apply it. Come to this table not because there is any possibility at all that you deserve it, but come because you don't deserve it. Come just like this dying man, committing yourself to the power of forgiveness, discovering the possibility of intimacy with this Christ, applying the work of the cross to your life, making Jesus king of the kingdom in your life and receiving the promise of paradise to be with Jesus forever. 
For every time you come to a table like this, to Eucharist, you come to consider Jesus again, again. Consider Jesus again, every day. And certainly every time you come to this table. I have two priests who are going to come help me. Will my priests come? We are the priesthood of believers. And Re is one priest and Bethany is another. And as we come, they are going to serve you. There will be no music. It will be quiet. We're going to invite you to come to the center and walk to this table and receive bread from Re and the juice from Bethany. And they're going to speak to you words that I hope allow you to consider Jesus again and again and again. Remember Christ's body for you on the cross. Remember Christ's blood for you on the cross. If there's anyone that for any reason feels you should not partake, that is totally fine. There's no shame or embarrassment in that. It's good to be honest. For whatever reason, just remain seated. But others, come to the center and to the front. If you want to linger a moment and really receive this gift from God, Eucharist, giving thanks for what Christ has done for us. Also, I should say, if, if you need a gluten-free situation, uh, this bread is gluten-free, and this cup will be for those using gluten-free. You can also take bread and either dip it in a cup, if you prefer that, in tinction, or you can take from this cup a common cup and sip it, whatever is best for you, okay? Scriptures say that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And that same night he took a cup and he said, this wine is my blood, a new covenant, a new way of relating to God that's not based on your goodness or your perfection, but based on what I've done for you. Drink and remember my blood for you. Eucharist, oh, we give thanks for what you've given us, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come as you would like.